isn't this getting to be interesting? It is, yes. Now, let's define black. Uh, here's a fax from Jerry in Clovis, California. My teacher, a colleague, told me the Egyptians were very dark Caucasians. I guess this new discovery proves it to be true. They were not black. Uh, so, do you want to stick with your description of a black man, or would this be a dark-skinned Egyptian, or is that too close a call to make? No, the description was a black, black man. man. A black man. Yeah, yeah. Before this video begins, it's fundamental that we establish three foundational concepts to this topic, some interchangeable but by no means rendered any less crucial for it. Foremost, Cultural genocide, or as it's commonly abbreviated, culturecide, can be defined in John Wiley and Sons Encyclopedia of Empire as the attempted destruction of a group's culture, religion and identity. It is a coercive act imposed by a dominant group upon a weaker or minority group. Cultural genocide has been associated with imperialism and with settler colonialism. It is particularly associated with forced religious conversion and with forced assimilation policies, including child removal and the outlawing of cultural expression. I think this quote establishes the concept quite succinctly. Cultural genocide is an oppressive operation of attrition that erodes, suppresses and leaves bare the passionate, centuries, often millennia-long societal contributions of thousands upon thousands of imaginative individuals cooperating under the banner of the cultural unity that binds them. However, if the prospect of that alone makes your blood boil, brace yourselves, because it only gets worse. For systemic cultural erasure and gaslighting can be taken one step further and descend into what in my opinion could be considered even deeper depths of insidiousness in the form of cultural theft and appropriation. An article by the Britannica does well to sum up cultural appropriation as the process by which members of a majority group adopt cultural elements of a minority group in an exploitative, disrespectful or stereotypical way. The appropriation of culture, like its genocidal counterpart, is in equal regards an oppressive effort of attrition that subtly and or aggressively corrodes a population's identity, but distinct from culture-side in the fact that it comes from a more abstract malevolence, for not only does it erase its victims, it carefully hollows them out and wears their skin, leaving the victims and their descendants cold and shivering, detached from the identity that cemented their place in the world. It can be employed on a broad spectrum of scales from relatively inconsequential to the grandiose, with quite literally millions of dollars worth of funds invested into its practice. Unlike culture side, it finds its roots not only in hatred via xenophobia and fear of the token other, but hatred rooted in envy, a desire to become that which you admire, that which you can observe at a distance, but never lay any veritable claim to. It is a crime that forces those descending from its victims to stare the legacy of their ancestors' efforts in the face. A dead facade worn upon the foreign flesh of invaders and thieves. These two terms are closely linked to the concept of cultural continuity, which within anthropological context deduces that if two separate civilizations exhibit cultural consistencies and similarities, then they're likely held from the same place or ancestor civilization, taking with them the aspects of shared identity that make up that all-important concept. Culture. And when this concept is brought into context with the insidious practices of European colonialism, the unforgivable transatlantic slave trade, and the attitudes towards those subjugated and dehumanised by chattel slavery, we can be drawn to the case study of ancient Kemet, and its detachment from the indigenous African peoples who birthed it. Indigenous peoples, who through the post-colonial lens which still scars our modern perceptions of them, are still in this year 2023 struggling to bring to the mainstream that which has been quite obvious for centuries that indigenous black African peoples hailing from Tar Seti and the Greater Lakes at the source of the Nile are the foundational architects of all aspects of ancient Kemetic culture throughout its dynasties prior to foreign colonial rule. And if you really don't believe the struggle to assert that fact despite its countless advocates has been taking place for that long, simply remember the wise words of Count Constantine de Volney, who unlike many, didn't let his abject shock and dismay at the evidence deter him from the objective truth of Comet's indigenous and distinctly Ninotic African ethnography. Just think that this race of black men, today our slaves and object of our sworn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences and even the use of speech. Facts did not care about his feelings, and he accepted that. And with all that being said, and for a video about culture, we are finally required to accept a working definition of just that word, culture.
which Edward Burnett, 19th century founder of cultural anthropology, defines in the earliest anthropological explanation of the term as that complex whole which includes knowledge, belief, art, morals, law, custom, and any other capabilities and habits acquired by man as a member of society. And in the case of this video, hair. In order to commence an exploration into hair culture in Kemet, we primarily need to look more broadly to the continent at large and come to terms with what hair means and has meant to African peoples as a whole, along with the diversity of hair types and forms exhibited by them. The African hair culture we see today that may be associated by the layman as a product of modernity actually predates the 21st century by millennia, so much so that modern African hair culture can be more aptly regarded as a post-colonial rediscovery of historical practices, not only for their superficial value as a beautiful and complex art form, but for the deeper meanings that those specific styles held for the cultures that developed them, personally, socially, and spiritually. Meanings lost to the cultural devastation of centuries of European genocidal despotism, and only in recent times being brought back to life. For example, in the book Hair Story Untangling the Roots of Black Hair in America, authors Ayana Bird and Laurie L. Tharps explain that braids and other intricate hairstyles were historically worn to signify marital status, age, religion, wealth, and rank in society. From king's ornate beaded braids to special headdresses worn by new mothers, these stars had deep cultural and historical roots to those that crafted and adorned them. Hair was also thought to be a source of personal and spiritual power. As the most elevated part of the body, some communities believed that it connected them with the divine, as in Yoruba culture, where people would braid their hair to send messages to the gods. Although examples such as these barely scratch the surface of the yet uncovered history of African hair culture, these insights won't lead anyone to much surprise when they discover that European oppressors, in witnessing for the first time the deep-rooted ties between African peoples and their hair, threatened by its sophistication and value to those they were attempting to subjugate, decided to take it upon themselves to ruin and raise that sacred aspect of African identity. During the transatlantic slave trade, an era of history that brutalised and enslaved nearly 15 million African men, women and children, one of the first courses of action enacted by the slave traders on the people they captured was to shave off their hair, the first step in what was to become a seemingly endless gauntlet of systemic culture and identity erasure. Considering the strong spiritual and cultural importance of hair in Africa, it was a particularly dehumanising act, intended to strip away their connections to their cultures. And when their hair grew back, they no longer had access to the herbal treatments, oils, and combs from their homeland. Hair that was once a source of pride and expression of identity was now often tucked away beneath cloth to cover and shield it from hours spent toiling under the sun. With limited tools and time to care for their hair, people got creative with what they had at their disposal, relying on bacon grease, butter, kerosene as conditioners, cornmeal as dry shampoo, and sheep fleece carding tools as combs. Braids also transformed into a tool for slaves looking to escape to freedom. As drawing or writing directions was often too risky, they would cornrow their hair to map escape routes, braiding the plaits into patterns that represented specific roads to travel or avoid. Small portions of gold and seeds were also hidden in the braids to sustain them after their escape. The story of African hair and its long-standing struggle with the oppressive class that sought to diminish its potentials is a story that went on and on even so far as to outright ban it, in the case of the Tignon Law of 1786, when the governor of Louisiana mandated that all black women wear a Tignon wrap over their hair, a law brought into effect after three black women in the South started wearing their hair in beautiful, elaborate styles that attracted a lot of attention, which many saw as a threat to the status quo, and is a struggle still waging on in our modern era, with bills such as the Crown Act, the first legislation in US history to ban discrimination based on hairstyle and texture, only recently making its way into federal law. As we can plainly see, African hair goes much deeper than the route from which it ascends. And in the case of ancient Kemet, this was no different, with some contemporary theories even going so far as to explore its influence on the very crowns adorned by its kings and queens. We will explore the cultural vibrancy and continuity between African culture today and that of ancient Kemetic civilization, in addition to addressing some of the lies formulated to refute that fact. Starting with a token favourite of mine, often coined the Kemetic Short Twist. The Kemetic Short Twist can be most often identified as a neat, medium to cascading head of distinctive twists and curls, sported by both ancient Egyptian men and women alike. <laughs> 
However, despite its abundance in the various statues and wall paintings of the time period, the style itself is an intriguing, if somewhat amusing, case study, because it isn't always considered to be the actual hairstyles of the Egyptians at all, at least not in the eyes of modern Egyptology, by obfuscating many of the hairdos as wigs. Summing up Egyptology's reluctance to accept these depictions as the legitimate hairstyles of those adorning them isn't easy, but is foundational to this topic of cultural appropriation and so I'll do my best to present it. Excluding the fact that ancient North African and Mediterranean populations wouldn't necessarily reflect the populations inhabiting those same regions in the 21st century, when under the assumption that the majority of ancient Kemetic populations were of a quote-unquote Mediterranean type, the logical assumption is that any hair type that doesn't match the typically straight to loose curls of those modern populations must not in fact be their real hair at all. Hence, the Kemetic short twist's common attribution to a Nubian wig, products assumedly worn almost exclusively by the upper ruling class who could afford such luxuries, and by extension obfuscating any notion of black indigenous Africanity within the ancient Egyptian ruling class. Wigs that, according to modern Egyptology, were adorned by the rich and wealthy Egyptians in mimicry of the styles adorned by the people of Nubia, the very people with whom modern Egyptology asserts the Egyptians shared very little phenotypical cultural continuity with, besides that which the Nubians supposedly adopted from the Egyptians and not vice versa. An assertion contradicted by a plethora of modern evidence, such as the Kustal incense burner, to name but a few, an item of artistic stonework found in Nubia and depicting the white crown of Upper Egypt centuries before Egypt's unification and its first dynasty of rulers. Back to the case in point. Exactly where and when depictions of this style are in fact wigs or the real thing is rarely ever clarified by traditional Egyptology, and when it does, it is rooted largely in casual hypotheses, pointing to the obvious shortcomings of the theory, which is still allowed to stand merely because few within popular Western academia attempt to scrutinise the theory in any way that enhances the ancient Kemites' indigenous Africanity. Of course, this doesn't mean to say that Egyptian wigs haven't been found, because they have, but the hypothesis that they were in mimicry of a style that the ancient Egyptians themselves couldn't achieve because it was an indigenous African hair type, and by extension not Egyptian, is a product of our post-colonial notions of the ethnic identity of the indigenous Kemites as distinctly not indigenous black African. It willfully excludes any possibilities that such styles were simply complicated and time-consuming to achieve with their own African hair, and in possessing a wig allowed them to bypass that process, a luxury afforded only to the rich and powerful of the time. After all, the sporting of wigs of one's own hairstyle is something we still see on a large scale today, especially for the purposes of bypassing extensive hair care and preparation for styles that could still be achieved with natural hair, but not without the inconvenience of effort and time consumption that is often required to do so. So, with that discrepancy aside, what was this style actually like in person? For that, we can look no further than the Afar people in our first case study of cultural continuity in this video. The Afar, an ethnic group inhabiting the northeastern African countries of Djibouti, Somalia, Ethiopia and Eritrea, famous for, among many other hair forms, their elaborately curled Dita styling technique, achieved with locally sourced butters and oils twisted around smoothened sticks, accentuating their hair's natural coils and simultaneously protecting it from the sun. The tiered styling technique visibly exposing each individual coil distinctly mimics the layering twists visible in ancient Kemetic wall art and statuettes of the Kemetic short twist. Additionally, the time and skill required to achieve this style is itself evidence towards a more reasonable cause for the ancient Egyptian development of wigs, as opposed to it merely being adopted by the Egyptian elite because it was trendy. But now, to you, the viewer, I raise my own question. Had you before this video ever heard of the Afar peoples? If so, well done and thank you, for you've clearly been lucky enough to observe and immerse yourself in the knowledge of Africa's rich and prosperous cultural heritage, even despite the finite lenses that allow us to do so. But if you hadn't, don't blame yourself. Blame it on the willful ignorance of academia that chooses to ignore and suppress any notions of cultural continuity between modern continental African and ancient Egyptian culture, in favour of more far-reaching theories, such as those that determine it more probable that ancient Egyptians mimicked Nubian hairstyles as opposed to simply possessing the hairstyles themselves. It also stands to mention that depictions of this style aren't isolated to Kemetic artwork alone, but to depictions of the ancient Egyptians from external sources as well. Take this bronze Roman vase from Alexandria during the 2nd century BCE in the form of the head of a quote, Egyptian youth, now on display at the National Archaeological Museum of Florence. Or this Onikoe, 
from Leontopolis in the Nile Delta of a similar style to the Roman vase. Or here's another 2nd century BCE Hellenistic Greek statue head depicting a quote-unquote Nubian man, because remember, according to traditional Egyptology, any African in Egypt has to be Nubian, because the Egyptians weren't by their metrics black African. The list of artworks goes on and on, many consistently depicting the distinctive twists of the ancient Kemites and Afar people who've carried that ancient legacy into the 21st century. But the Daita twists of the Afar aren't the only of its kind expressing commonality with the ancient Egyptian hairstyles. One doesn't need to look afar from the Afar to find the Hamar people, a vibrant ethnic group living in the southwestern Hamar district of Ethiopia, one of several ethnic groups residing in the Omo Valley, which is itself one of the most ethnically diverse portions of East Africa. They are also closely related in ethnicity and culture to the Bana people, from whom they separated centuries ago due to disputes over pastures, with significant cultural continuities still prevalent across both peoples. The distinctive twist and lock hairstyles adorned by the Hamer and Bana, commonly signatures of beauty and marital status, are achieved through a combination of traditional butters and red ochre, as well as the trimming of twists to form a desired shape. Excluding the fact that red ochre amongst other natural hair additives such as henna, still utilised in Africa today were prevalent in ancient Egypt, i.e. in the hair of the mummy of Ramses II, the finished style of the hammer can be found in abundance throughout Kemetic artwork, notable among them in the famous statuette of Lady Keradwank, mother of Imhotep, the multi-genius polymath, father of medicine and architect of Pharaoh Joseph's iconic step pyramid. It also serves to note that amongst the Hamar, Bana and other closely related peoples, it can also be customary to adorn the finished stars with a traditional ostrich feather, a custom observed in iconography of Mart, in addition to being depicted in other stylistic forms atop Kemetic hair and crowns. As to specifically which stars present within Kemetic culture were in fact twists, locks, braids, curls, or any other manner of hairstyles, is a complicated question as it's quite clear that there was a plethora of cultural and ethnic overlap within ancient Kemet that will have translated into a creative blending of hairstyles and techniques, a veritable melting pot of indigenous African culture that's only to be expected given Kemet's far-reaching and millennia-spanning empire. Unfortunately, however, these deeper, more nuanced insights into the specific workings of ancient Egyptian hair culture are still being gatekept by our post-colonial notions of ancient Egypt, as the more practical insights into African and by extension Kemetic hair culture can be most aptly provided by the very peoples of indigenous African descent who are still incorporating those hairstyling techniques into their lives today, and will continue to be put on hold until Egyptology finally comes to terms with Kemet's indigenous Africanity instead of continuing to pander to gross conjecture that attributes these stars to inanimate wigs and by extension denying the ancient Kemites the diversity of hair types exhibited by them and by the peoples who today identify as black Africans. Peoples such as the Oromo, Habesha and Trigrayan peoples of Ethiopia, whose traditional hairstyles in combination with other cranial decorations bear striking resemblance to the New Kingdom dancers adorning the walls of the tomb of Nebuman, dated to 1350 BC. In comparing these similarities in hair culture continuity, we can also recognise continuities in aspects besides hair culture, such as the colourful beaded necklaces adorned in the same painting, still prevalent to this day in Zulu cultural ceremonies, as well as to a more stylized degree in the beaded shawls of the Nilotic Maasai and Samburu peoples. Or perhaps we might also notice representations of instruments including the Kemetic lute and its consistency with the Molo lutes of West Africa, or the Kemetic harps and their own similarities with the still utilised Kra harps of Ethiopia and Eritrea and the Odungu harps of Uganda. Or we could even take our sights to the distinctive objects adorning the women's heads, a consistency across a plethora of ancient Kemetic artwork. Until recently, these objects were an enigma, generally referred to as head cones as not a single one had been excavated, leading some within Egyptology to theorise that they were in fact ineffable or symbolic, similar to the Christian tradition of depicting halos, because of course, all their theories were looking towards the Near East and not Africa. However, in 2009, the Amarna Project, a University of Cambridge-led National Geographic-funded team of researchers, excavated the burial of two Egyptian adults in the ancient Egyptian site of Amarna, allowing researchers to finally crack the code of the enigmatic head cones, presenting their findings in a study published in 2019, in which they revealed that the cones were in fact hollow containers of perfumed wax, folded around additional organic matter that likely produced further fragrances. It was a major discovery that contradicted prior theories which themselves could have found themselves grounded closer to reality if Egyptology had only looked to Africa 
and discovered that this same tradition was still being practiced by the Cushitic speaking Rendil people of northeastern Kenya, who still adorn the perfumed cones, with the addition of red ochre as a means to symbolizing the ongoing lives of particular relatives in a stoic preservation of millennia old tradition. Multiple degrees of African cultural continuity, all crammed into one single wall painting, so many of which continue to be appropriated to this day and in plain sight. Still don't believe me? Well, take a look at this book that I chanced upon in my university library, Peter Croyd's Kingdom of the Dead Voyages Through Time, and its depiction of yet more traditional Kemetic hairstyles. If you're unaware of the depictions in question, it's safe to say that it's a poor attempt at mimicking the traditional ancient Kemetic side braid of youth, sometimes also referred to by Egyptology as the Horus Lock, Prince's Lock, Princess's Lock, and Lock of Childhood, despite the fact in not a single depiction of the style is it ever merely a lock, but a very obvious braid. The side braid was an identifying characteristic of children in ancient Kemet, and so it probably wouldn't have looked like this either. On the other hand, it is still to this day an identifying characteristic of the Himba children of northwestern Namibia, albeit somewhat adapted since its inception during Kemet's Old Kingdom nearly 5,000 years ago. I think it's quite plain to see that the legacy of the long since fallen Egyptian empire is very much still alive within its modern indigenous African descendants, and exploring each and every iteration of this, as enjoyable as I might find it, would do little more in cementing that point. As to exploring the biological and chemical intricacies of human hair, whilst having some bearing on the debate isn't itself an insight into hair culture and is therefore a topic for another video. So, as a final topic of enquiry, I'm going to turn the table on its head and attempt to explore the budding discourse around pharaonic crowns, which in a video about hair culture might sound somewhat inappropriate, a notion that I'll attempt to dilute in recognising that ancient Egyptian crowns, distinct from those exhibited by other cultures, might in fact owe their very existence and forms to the African hair of those adorning them, justified by the personal and societal value that African peoples and cultures placed upon their hair, as presented earlier on in this video. In order to effectively introduce this discourse, I'd like to first draw your attention to the Nemes, perhaps the most famous and iconic of Egyptian royal headdress, sported by some of the most famous of Kemet's so far excavated rulers. To the understanding of Egyptology, the Nemes is a striped cloth which drapes over the head to fall about the shoulders. Beyond metal circlets and accessories, no intact crown has yet been excavated by archaeologists, owing the vast majority of our knowledge of its existence to its depictions in Kemetic works of art. Now whilst this in itself isn't an entirely improbable theory, one could argue that it is only half of the truth, as the assertion that the crown is cloth and that alone is somewhat contradicted by the consistencies in the crown's inflated volume across its many depictions, often swollen to a degree that no mere cloth has any real right to. Although Egyptology hasn't explicitly addressed this discrepancy, within the context of this video I'm going to present the theories proposed by an abundance of prior researchers in establishing that this volume can itself be owed to the distinctly African hairstyles that inspired these crowns. From where comes the grounds for this assertion? Well we might first look to the words of Diodorus Siculus in the third book of his Bibliotheca Historica in which he recounted from his travels to Egypt between the pages of 95 to 96 that like the Egyptian priests, and having the same dress and form of staff which is shaped like a plough, and is carried by their kings, who wear high felt hats which end in a knob at the top and are circled by the serpents which they call asps. In this account of the pharaohs of Egypt, albeit firmly within the Hellenistic period of ancient Egypt's history, we can best assume that Diodorus was referenced to the high felt hats ending in a knob and circled by asps, as referring to the white crown of Upper Egypt. However, the notion of something as delicate as felt supporting a shape and form of this scale is at once a little hard to believe, especially under Egyptology's prevailing notion that the majority of Egyptian pharaohs shaved their heads bald, logically assuming that the white crown was hollow and made of a material harder than fabric in order to support its height, contradicted by Diodorus' reference to felt. But perhaps indeed the crown was made of fabric, but not hollow after all, and filled with material to support it. But then that also demands the question, what was this material? Well, when you acknowledge the possibility that it might have been hair, the problem doesn't seem nearly as open-ended. Cometic crowns across all their ranging forms present consistencies with recognisable, often dynamic and distinctive African hairstyles. And if those very hairstyles have been and are still utilised as signatures of status within African societies, it isn't a stretch to assume that pharaonic crowns, in their equal role as symbols of status as ruler, could bear overlap with African hair culture. 
In conclusion, Egyptology is looking in the wrong direction, and has been for far too long. Africa had been practicing civilization in Tarseti many centuries before Mesopotamian emergence in the Fertile Crescent, and until mainstream academia stops burying its head in the sand and continuing to scavenge for evidence to their Eurocentric ends in the Near East instead of Africa, the debate will only perpetuate and both the willful and blissful delusion will continue. It's important to remember that the question of ancient Kemetic ethnography is not a discourse by Africans for Africans, but one forced upon them by Europeans and their attempt to bolster and maintain notions of white supremacy across the global stage. Ancient Kemetic history is not only a story of African peoples on African soils, but a shared history with the story of Arab and European colonialism across the ages that attempted and continues to attempt to tear those pages from the history books and replace it with their own, at the detriment of countless millions of African men, women and children suffering across generations for the egos of people who in pursuit of mutual gain, their ancestors had at first openly welcomed to their shores. African people, deserved of their history, which was rewritten by the victor in the image of the victor, against which the decolonizing of that history is not something that African people ever wanted for themselves, but is now their responsibility to do so, for themselves, their children, and the memory of those that came before them. No, they were dark skinned, but, but they were not, not black. But they are not negro. Mm. Because look at the, the, the length of the the Negroes like that, and the nose like this. It's not really in the Egyptian uh, origin at all. It's mm. different, completely different. Mm.